I just want to say, you know, you're speaking to polyculture and talk, talking about um, agroforestry. So, you know, I, I think about like the kind of pressure. So if there's a sort of pressure to constantly look for food, constantly look for food, right? That is going to push a certain species to do certain things. And with human beings, it seems like our ability to shape our lived environments. I mean, other species do this as well, but we do it in a really profound way. I mean, we're seeing kind of the through a kind of capitalist or colonial logic, we've <laughs> extended it to this point of of ecological collapse and you know degradation. So, but but within kind of pre so called prehistory, um, human beings developed. I mean, they, they cultivated entire ecologies to produce an abundance of foods. I mean, I know that every place was different, but if they could, they would ensure that certain types of plants would produce certain types of fruits or vegetables or nuts. They would make sure that certain types of, of vegetation would attract certain types of animals to come in so that they could then domesticate them or hunt them, right? So in a way, it, it makes complete sense that our, our, our like, uh, I mean, almost like borderline starvation through the majority of our existence as a species would have led to this point of where we really wanted to produce abundance uh, in, in how we have access to food. Um, but of course that, you know, through kind of a capitalist organization of a global economy produces monotony and monoculture agriculture to the point where that diversity that could come from agroforestry um, gets reduced to basically you're you're like you know as we're seeing in like many forests around the world they're destroying incredibly ecologically diverse areas in order to produce like one or two crops for one or two species so it's like it, it's interesting how it shifted to that and of course it's having really detrimental consequences for all life right now yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the article I have at Descent Magazine is kind of like just a, a good uh, small taste, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, um, an amuse-bouche uh, to a lot of these uh, big questions. Mm -hmm. but, and, and one of the things I do talk about is agroforestry, because I think it's a very interesting way of, of looking at this question of polyculture versus monoculture. And, you know, and what I end up saying at one point is like, okay, so Malcolm Harris says that um, under socialism, uh, there would be far fewer bananas for America, for Americans, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the whole debate, you know, part of the problem of these uh, Twitter debates is by nature they're glib um and often in in you know they're they're uh floating in this fact-free ether um mm -hmm. and so he does a math and says you know there's 120 bananas for every um american man woman and child right and yeah. and that's true that's the amount and but the thing is i looked at the global production of of bananas and plantains um the um so the global industry is producing 120 bananas for every man, woman, and child on the planet, it turns out, about a trillion bananas a year, um, divided among 8 billion people. And so it's uneven, right? Everything uh, about societies are uneven, right? It's it's some people, you know, I eat very few bananas because I don't particularly care for um, mm -hmm. the Cavendish uh, bananas. But um, 400 million people in the world depend on uh, bananas and plantains for up to 25% of their caloric intake. So the biggest producer of banana in the world is not Ecuador. Um, it turns out it's India. It produces over five times the amount of bananas. It produces 33 million tons. That's 70 billion pounds. Um, that's over 50 pounds uh, for every man, child, woman in India. Mm -hmm. 
And and so um, the thing about that is, so when we're asking these questions about like, will there be bananas under socialism? I'm like, of course there will be because bananas uh, are an incredibly important part of the human diet in, in many uh, parts of, of the world already. Um, the, the question then becomes like, who is going to produce it? Um, under what conditions it will be produced, and what uh, type of trading is going to go on. So, you know, one of the things I, I say is like, look, you know, if, if we uh, have socialism, meaning we decommodify bananas, first of all, um, the banana growers, whether they are the farmers who would control their own labor, um, would have very little incentive to engage in monoculture, um, I, I, I agriculture, um, even if they were going to export uh, most of uh, their crops. And certainly they have no incentive to engage, engage in monoculture agriculture that is toxic to them, that is um, involves like, uh, you know, 100 hour work weeks of backbreaking labor um, where they have, you know, they don't have even the bare uh, minimum um, uh, in terms of uh, subsistence right beyond like maybe just uh, 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 food and water, right? They don't have health care. They don't have um, um, sanitation, potable water, you know, safe, uh, comfortable housing, education, all those things. They're not going to willingly um, in, engage in that. What they will do is the first thing they'll they'll care about is making sure that they have enough nutrition, them, their families, their communities, and then we can imagine them being parts of networks and concentric circles of larger communities, you know, um, of of you know nearby communities, of regional communities, of trans regional communities, you know, maybe. Some countries would still exist. We don't know that. Um, that's all speculative. Um, their incentive would be for long-term uh, development, um, both of their community, of, of the soil. Um, again, another thing that I really wasn't um, able to get into was the metabolic rift. Mm -hmm. So this this is a concept that John Bellamy Foster um, over at Monthly Review has written about a lot that he gets from uh, Marx, uh, where Marx points out that, you know, a, a capitalism, what it does is it isn't just um, it is both the exploitation of humans and the soil itself. And we don't think about how just phenomenally important the soil is to human existence. And in fact, we can think of the um, industrial revolution that isn't even three centuries old, right? Going back to 1750 as basically two simple exchanges. Um, and, and this is the metabolic rift. The first exchange is carbon is going from the soil in the form of fossilized sunlight, right? Hyd hydrocarbons, oil, coal, natural gas. It's going from the soil and being dumped into the atmosphere and the oceans. Then the second exchange is nitrogen is going from the atmosphere. And this is via uh, the production of fertilizer using natural gas. It's going from the atmosphere and being dumped into the soil and waterways. And so these two very simple exchanges, nitrogen and carbon from um, one part of the biosphere to the other, um, explain everything about uh, our modern uh, society. And so banana farmers obviously will want to um, uh, ratchet that back as much as possible um, because they don't want to burn out the soil. They obviously mm -hmm. don't want to contribute uh, to runaway uh, climate change that is going to make uh, their uh, basic existence completely unviable. You know, that's where we're mm -hmm. headed to, mm -hmm. where whether it's the Andean regions um, where the glaciers are going to melt and water, you know, the rivers that feed uh, agriculture uh, um, is going to make it unviable or whether the heat in uh, uh, Central America, Mesoamerica is going to make it uh, unlivable. 
uh, you know, they do, would not have any incentive um, to continue with that system. Um, so what they would want to do is to be able to feed themselves for long-term sustainability, feed their families, their communities, as I mentioned, um, and be able to develop uh, socially. And that's where trade gets in, right? You know, if, if we think about like socialism is not going to happen when the world becomes completely equal, because of course that's never going to happen under capitalism. Um, so there will still be uneven development. So you know, the uh, rich, richer northern countries who, um, you know, exploited and stole all, the, all the, uh, these people and raw materials and goods from the global south, you know, under socialism, they may be like, hey, I'm like, you know, I gave the example of like, you know, the uh, people's, uh, you know, uh, Soviets of uh, greater New York might mm -hmm. decide like, you know, hey, you know, um, uh, farmers in Ecuador, you know, will trade you um, uh, wind turbines, uh, uh, computer technology, and doctors um, for uh, bananas, and much more important uh, uh, than bananas, we also want uh, that uh, uh, coffee beans and uh, cocoa for our chocolate and yeah. you know you know that's a funny thing about this whole debate i'm like no one cares no one cares about bananas it's just like let's yeah. talk what you know what would especially leftists care about you know it's just like I, you know, Marxists would be the first to pick up the gun if a socialist government told them, OK, no more uh, coffee or chocolate, uh, no more uh, wine or whiskey, um, and no more uh, spices, you know, yeah, it's right. just like yeah. that's a st that's the stuff we really care about. You know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So there would be trade going on. And so. Here, then, we can start to bring in the concept of agroforestry, because, again, this is something I wasn't able to get into. There is this whole question question of what I call de-peasantization. Um, so this is a phenomenon that's been going on for hundreds of years, um, you know, with the Industrial Revolution. I think it's in only maybe the last five years or so where humanity finally passed the point where a majority of people are urbanized, but still close to half of humanity, over three billion people, are still peasants. They're still mm. uh, largely subsistence farmers. And so do we want to see more people in urbanized areas, in cities? There are efficiencies to that. Um, you know, living in, in New York City, because it's just like you, I bike or walk or, you know, I'm not a fan of the subways because uh, the city, the state's been running them into the ground, but I mm -hmm. still do take it. You know, it's just like what I don't use is is a car. Um, I live in an apartment, meaning that the floor below me, the floor above me, the walls on either side, I'm sharing with people. So that mm -hmm. reduces energy usage. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, New Yorkers use half the amount of energy per GDP as Americans do in general. And who the hell knows? We probably use maybe one third uh, the amount of uh, energy or one quarter, let's say, uh, per unit of GDP, as in parts of like, you know, Texas or Wyoming or Idaho. Um, so it is when you're talking about climate change, and, and it's funny because I, I I used to say this like 20 years ago to kind of needle friends who uh, went back to the land uh, saying, you know, we kind of need a reverse pole pod where we move people into the cities and, and rewild uh, vast uh, swaths of the environment. But at the same time, you know, I, I was just, uh, like I said, needling them, mm. you know, humans are not separate from the environment and that's where the agroforestry comes in agroforestry mm -hmm. is a form of agriculture it is not hunting and gathering these these are not no, yeah. you know these are not paleolithic societies and so i, I gave one example because i think it all often helps people to be able to visualize what we're talking about agroforestry is basically forest gardens but they're they involve a lot of we can say um, pre-industrial um, uh, or ancient science, right? You know, ancient peoples did have 
a lot of science that they used, even if they didn't recognize it as such. There was experimentation, observation, trial and error. So in many, if not all parts of the world, um, there were different types of agroforestry. So in some of the most extensive systems that have existed and are still around today in New Guinea, um, what you'll find is, first of all, that tubers are layered in the earth. Um, there's taro and sweet potatoes that are just below the surface. Then cassava, which is one of the most important tubers eaten in the world in terms of um, uh, providing a lot of ca caloric intake. And then yams uh, at, at the deepest part. Then on the surface of the soil, there's mat a mat of uh, uh, sweet potato leaves and taro leaves that covers the soil, right? So that helps to deter pests um, and burrowing animals. It keeps in uh, uh, moisture. Uh, the leaves themselves can also be eaten. And above them are hibiscus, uh, sugarcane, and, and banana um, uh, plants. And what this does is, you know, these food forests and uh, they protect the tropical soil, which tends to be thin. Uh, they deter um, uh, different types of insects and they make very efficient use of, of all the sunlight. But this is something a system that is labor intensive. Um, it can be highly productive. And in other parts um, of the world, you know, like in, in Brazil, or, you know, there's agroforestry going on in Bangladesh, even though it's it's extremely um, crowded country, it's not not just food that they're producing, they're producing building materials, they're producing fibers um, uh, for clothing, for rope, um, they're uh, producing uh, uh, medicinal uh, uh, medicines. Um, so they're very much kind of holistically getting much of what they need from the forest and they produce a surplus that they then trade. And when we think about, um, you know, what uh, Marx's idea of uh, communism was uh, uh, producers for themselves, right? So that people who are producing are not uh, commodified, they're not selling their label labor they're producing for themselves and in a way agroforestry you know is is kind of um a prefigurative um possibility of of this uh, kind of communism with a small c ideal um, but, you know, again, one of the complexities and paradoxes, we don't want to fetishize localism. You know, we don't want to say like trade is bad. I think that's what Harris's mistake is, that he is implying, you know, trade is bad when he says, you know, Americans would have uh, fewer uh, bananas and that's fine. What I would argue is, you know, Americans would have fewer Cavendish bananas and that's fine. Um, yeah. Because of agroforestry, there would be a lot more different types types of bananas, there would also be a lot more different types of tropical fruits, you know, yeah. like uh, pineapples and dragon fruit and, and mangoes and papayas and guavas and on and on and on. Um, I think we would also see, you know, forgotten fruits in um, North America would maybe make a comeback, um, whether it's like, you know, persimmons or huckleberries, uh, mulberries, salmon berries, uh, pawpaws. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, but this this is a very complicated debate because it's just like, you know, I think people, you know, who are on the Promethean left and in other words, who like kind of wor worship production and productivism and we need to grow the economy would say like, ah, this is just like, you know, some sort of like hippie ideal of a back to the land. And I'm like, well, it's actually a lot more complicated than that because for one, uh, when you look at global unemployment, underemployment, um, that it's something like half a billion workers. Um, there's also about 2 billion workers who are um, in the informal economy. So actually a majority of the global workforce does not have like kind of meaningful uh, sustainable work, you know, and mm -hmm. even in the U.S., in North America, 
I think there are a lot of people who talk about they'd like to go back to the land. Of course, I don't think they understand how difficult it would be. Um, you know, and I'm not an anarchist. I'm very much, I think, because it, even if you don't want to call it a state, um, to coordinate um, the needs and production of, for 8 billion people ac across the planet while ensuring that we don't, you know, trash the biosphere and instead heal it whatever um, coordinating apparatus that has coercive functions, because you're going to need to have coercive functions, it's it's still going to look a lot like a state. So, but mm. instead, instead of state serving capital, it, it should be serving people, it should be serving communities, right? And so it then becomes this, like I said, the it's it's only something you can build, right? I think a big part of the problem of this debate is, you know, I say it's it's they imagine socialism as this fixed endpoint, whereas socialism is something that's built and it would be constantly evolving. There is no endpoint. So it's like, how much mechanization do you use, right? I, I think obviously you would want, you know, mechanization like tractors. Um, but, you know, would there be, you know, for these three primary crops, wheat, rice, and um, uh, maize, maybe we would still have, you know, large scale uh, plantations. They would be like collectively run, um, you know, maybe, maybe not. I know there are people who contend that, no, you don't need to have these huge um, uh, plantations, but again, food is not like housing, right? If there's a shortage of housing, you can always double people up. You can triple people up. If there's a shortage of food, people starve and die. Um, yeah. You always want to be producing um, an excess to account uh, for any, um, you know, problems that, uh, and contingencies that might arise. Mm -hmm.